24 energies. Welcome everyone. Glad you are here. It's seven o'clock. Time for us to start with the Book of Judges again. Uh, every week, to me, uh, I just enjoy this book more and more. Uh, the Old Testament is a fascinating part of our Bible that, honestly, we often don't know enough about. And so as we go through this book, every week is a surprise. And so um, tonight, um, you know, if you want if you want stuff that's a little racy, you got it tonight. Uh, yeah. So uh, and for those of you who really enjoyed the gore last week, we've got more gore for you tonight. So uh, I sound like I'm in an election year, don't I? So, yes. Let's open with prayer. No more gore. <laughs> Father, we thank you for the Old and the New Testament where where we see Jesus prophesied and pointed to in the Old Testament and where he arrives and brings the kingdom of God in the new. So we pray tonight that as we look at another judge this evening, along with some other very important characters, uh, they all would point us to our Savior, and we would be strengthened in the hope that while we might live in a dark world, there is one coming to rescue God's people and bring us out of sin and death into eternal life. In his name we pray. Amen. Amen. So as we do every week, uh, a couple of people maybe to share some stories, and I had one plant ahead of time, so Nolan said he had a couple that he wanted to share this night. So Nolan, uh, what kind of experience did you have this week? On uh, on Saturday uh, for Emma's or for the kids band competition, I drive the, the truck down there, and I was wearing my NYG uh, law shirt with the pink flamingo on the back with the song, and the guy was that was riding with me, he looked at it, he was. He goes, well, what church do you go to? And I told him, I the hills, told him where we're at. He goes, I'm like, do you go to church? He goes, well, we kind of do. We just kind of go for the kids. So they can, they kind of bounce around from youth group to youth group. And so we spent about a half an hour drive talking about uh, church and, and Jesus and stuff like that. And it was, it was a fun conversation. I really enjoyed nice. it. Nice. And then at my work, we had a safety meeting. And uh, our, our new safety guy wanted us to, to send in uh, pictures of, of, so that we could remind ourselves why we do what we do. And so I thought it would be fun. And I submitted a picture of Jesus. And the guy I submitted to says, that's great and all, but I don't think that's what we're looking for. And then the safety guy goes, no, 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 put it up there anyway. And so now we've got a picture of Jesus on our board. Nice. <laughs> nice. Well, and that really is why you do what you do. I mean, you, you guys have jobs and you go out and you have to make a living for your family and, and we all do, right? But really you're doing that for Jesus. When you study the doctrine of vocation in the Bible, that that basically means God has a calling for you in life. You don't have to be a church worker to have a calling. Every believer does. And that can be as a, a worker, a mom, a, a grandpa, a anybody. God is calling you to serve the world in what you do. So at Nolan's job, he is serving the, the people that work there and the community and the, the places where he goes to work and all those kinds of things. Uh, just like all of you do. Uh, and so God called you there. God wanted you in that in that position at your job to give a witness. But also then he has another vocation as a dad. And so he's donating oodles of time on Saturdays for marching band. And sure enough, God said, yeah, I'm going to use that as well. And so it doesn't matter if you work or retire. It doesn't matter if you're young or old. God has a place for you to serve him in vocation. John. Yeah, Tom and I were out for breakfast Tuesday morning, and uh, the waitress, whose name was Amanda, I asked her if she needed something that we could pray for. She had absolutely nothing. She said, no, I, I don't need any prayer. I'm no. good, she said. Yes. And she well, you could pay for the firefighters. And I said, well, we already do that at our church, so I want something for you. And uh, she finally said her daughter. Okay. And so we got to do something that was personal for her. Yep. And uh, as someone said to me just the other day, uh, our job is not to, to, you know, force something to happen. That's up to the work of the Holy Spirit mm -hmm. and the individual. So uh, we just are there to witness. And uh, uh, I remember being in a restaurant once and asking our server, and he goes, no, I'm good. Yeah, we had that. And that was just closing the door. And, and okay, 
you know, nothing we can do about that. So don't be discouraged. It's not a criticism of you. Um, we might feel bad for them, but you don't need to feel discouraged about yourself. We're just messengers. We just have a great message to bring. All right, so keep your eyes and ears open this week. Where is God going to use you? It's kind of fun to think when you get out of bed in the morning. Somewhere today, God might have a person arranged that I'm going to uh, visit with while I'm out taking a walk or when I'm getting some food or when I'm at work. Uh, all those places. Be ready for that. Just let the Spirit guide you on that. Okay, so we're going to start a two-week, I'm, I'm hoping I can get next week all in one week, it's chapter five, the long chapter, so we'll, we'll see. Um, but it's a two-part story of, of a judge named Barak, but I, but I put Deborah's name first because in a sense she kind of initiates this. God uses her uh, as a mouthpiece, as a spokesperson to kind of give Barak a, a nice kick in the rear end to get him going. Uh, and so we have two parts of, to that. Uh, the first part is Judges 4, 1 to 24, and then chapter 5 we'll look at next week. And like I said, hopefully we'll finish it, but I think there's 31 verses or something like that. That's a lot to, that's a lot to get through. So we'll see. We'll see. We're not going to worry about it. Uh, so he, she is, he is not related to Obama. No, n n n nothing there. <laughs> he has two R's in his name. Yeah. Anyway, keeping politics out of it for now. Um, although there, there's, well, there's a whole branch we could go off on that, and I won't. All right, so let's take a look at Judges 4, 1 to 3. Who can read that? Uh, Becky, go ahead. Again, the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord, now that Ehud was dead. So the Lord sold them into the hands of Jabin, king of Canaan, who reigned in Hazor, Sisera, the commander of his army. With, ah, I didn't read that right. Who reigned in Hazor. Sisera, the commander of his army, was based in Herosheth Hagoyim, because he had 900 chariots fitted with iron and had cruelly oppressed the Israelites for 20 years, they cried to the Lord for help. All right. Thank you. So I, I just titled this segment once again. Uh, we looked in Chapter 2 of Judges. It shows, uh, it, it gives us the formula, this is what happens. And sure enough, we see that again. They did evil in the eyes of the Lord. Uh, and it, we're told there that, that the Lord sold them into the hands of Jabin, or Jabin, or however you want to pronounce it. Um, and this is the third time we see Israel sold. So let's take a look at that just by way of review. This won't take us but a second. Judges 2, 14, you want to read that, Tom? And who will read Judges 3, verse 8? John, we'll get that, okay? And then we'll get over here. So Judges 2.14, that's the formula. That says this is how it always happened. And then 3 verse 8 is an example. So 2.14. In his anger against Israel, the Lord handed them over to raiders who plundered them. He sold them to their enemies all around, whom they were no longer able to resist. So he sold them to their enemies all around. So this is this is what happened in the entire book, okay? And then one example, uh, chapter 3, verse 8, John. The anger of the Lord burned against Israel so that he sold them into the hands of Cushan, Rishathim, king of Aram, Nahare, <coughs> whom the Israelites were subjects for eight years. So there's the example, and that's our first judge, remember, Othniel. And so, again, God sold them into that. It's kind of interesting that that verb is used, isn't it? What other time in history might might you think that that would be heard of? Slave. That's right. So I, I didn't. I just thought of that now. I, I don't know if that's used in the book of Exodus, if that Hebrew word is used or not. But it's interesting to think about. A slave can be bought and sold. Uh, by the way, I saw a commercial for the movie Harriet. It looks really good. I want to go see that. But but a slave can be bought and sold as property. And so here Israel is. They're selling their birthright, their freedom as God's children to these false gods. And so God sells them into the hand of these raiders, as it says in Judges chapter 2. So how does that word sold translate in Hebrew? It is sold. That's, that's exactly what it says. So that's, I give you something, you give me something. So what are, what are, what are they giving God in return? They're giving grief. They're giving him grief. It says, you know, here, here's... You're going to pay for your disobedience. Uh, I'm going to uh, allow you to suffer so that you'll realize who you really need. 
So he's not doing, God is not selling them out of a spirit of vindictiveness. He's not just ticked off and, well, I'm going to get those Israelites. But it's a way of drawing them to repentance. In fact, um, I don't know if I have this in the, in the study or not, but um, think about when you suffer pain. What's one of the first things you do? Pray. You pray. That's right. And, and isn't it sad that when things are going really, really well for us, um, it's easy to forget to do that. Yeah. You know, it's prayers of thanksgiving. I mean, look at our prayer chain. 99% of our prayers are prayers of need. And there's nothing wrong with that. We should keep them coming. It's a good thing to do. But why is only 1% of our prayers thanks? Uh, I, I meet with Will King once a month. He's the guy that does our Instagram and Twitter and some of our uh, Facebook stuff. And, and, and so uh, I don't know if you have Instagram or not, but... but uh, the one that we put out yesterday, he and I talked about that. We said, let's put one out thanking God for electricity and warm water and things like that. Because how easy it is for us to gripe about PG&E, yeah. yeah. right? And, and they should be held accountable if they've been, if they've been wrong, if they've done underhanded things. But, but do we ever stop and thank God for what we, 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 we get angry. Uh, I was talking to somebody who said, uh, that they had a conversation with somebody, and what was the worst thing? Well, no TV. Oh, good Lord, no television. What could we do? We might talk to someone or something. Chuck and then John. I was listening to Tom's translation, and I think in place of the word sold, he had the word plundered. And okay. I'm looking at God owns all the materials of the Israelites. Yeah. So the, the payment that is made to those who plunder then would be that would be your transactional uh, perhaps yeah this uh, other people group comes in and takes your stuff take, takes your stuff God has given his stuff to them yeah. to punish Israel yep to draw them to repentance yep John well, you brought up an interesting point about the PG&E because I kind of think if I'm wrong tell me I kind of think that if we're provided a service which we pay for whether it be water or any of the infrastructure, the roads you drive on, whatever. Mm -hmm. As a taxpayer and as a ratepayer, don't I have the right to, to not necessarily complain, but to speak about the matter of to course. someone at that agency? Of course, yeah. Yeah, and that's, and, and like I said, if PG&E has been doing things, you know, like here's, here's one gripe I've heard that may be true, that instead of taking money over the last 30 years and investing it in the infrastructure, so we don't have power lines that are 50 years old, mm -hmm. money has been given, and we've all seen those bonuses, right? Right before they declare bankruptcy. Yeah. You know, that's enough to make anyone angry. So yes, um, businesses should be held accountable because that's a good check and balance against corruption. Absolutely. What I'm talking about more is we gripe and moan and complain uh, and, and I don't know if this stat is still true, but 20 years ago, I heard a stat that said around the world, only 30% <clears> of people have running water in their homes. Wow. And if we were not to have that, we would complain to no end. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, again, if, if, if EID is not doing their job, yes. Should they be held accountable? Yes. Um, but, but I just think it's important for us also to be thankful for electricity and water and, and those kinds of things. I mean, I, I took a hot shower Tuesday morning. Yes. I was pretty thankful. I felt pretty good. We were too. My water's on. And the staff that works with me was very thankful that I took a shower on Tuesday morning. So is the same author, is one author for the book? One author for the book of Judges, yes, I would say so. he does it three different ways. Does what three different well, ways? Here it said in 14, when I read 14, it said he handed them over. Yeah, but keep, sell them. keep reading. <clears throat> In verse 14. In his anger against Israel, the Lord handed them over to the Israels who plundered them. Okay, plundered. That's the verb that's translated sold in most of our translations. Okay. It's the same Hebrew word. And then before Ehud, he said uh, he gave Eglon, king of Moab, power over Israel. Yeah, and that's also there, but it, the, the same verb is there. I looked it up in Hebrew. I know it's there. Okay. Yeah, it's just different translation. All right, Hazor. It was a fortified city approximately 10 miles north of the Sea of Galilee. What's important about this? This moves the account of this event toward the northern tribes. Othniel was a judge in the tribe of? Benjamin. Judah. Very good. Right? And then we get to 
uh, Ehud, and he's from Benjamin. Benjamin. And then Shamgar is sort of, we don't really know for sure. I'm going to show you a map in a minute. Um, but we're moving north. And that's important because remember, the northern tribes are the ones that they lived among the Canaanites. So that's, that's part of this. So again, I'm just going to put this map up here. It's good for us to look at. So here's the tribe of Judah down here, this kind of tan area. Here's the tribe of Benjamin. See, Galilee is way up here. And we're going to see uh, Naphtali, Kiddush, and Naphtali is mentioned tonight. That's way up there. So we're getting up into the northern times a little bit. And then this map here, and I know it's hard to read, and I thought about blowing portions of it up, but I wanted you to see the whole thing. The red names are the names of the tribes. So Dan, Reuben, Gad, Simeon, Judah, uh, Dan, again, Benjamin, Ephraim. So that's where the tribes of Israel are located. And then you have in these boxes the names of some of the judges. Now, they put Shamgar way up here. I'm not sure about that, but some of them we don't know. But here's Ehud right there in Benjamin uh, and Othniel right here in, in Judah. So the reason I put this up is I wanted to remind you about our introduction where it says that the author of the book of Judges purposely structures these stories so everybody's included. Every tribe is included. And so Shamgar, remember he got one verse? And so here he is way up here. So we've got a judge way up there in the north. Uh, and we've got um, uh, Othniel way down south. And so what he's showing is the corruption of Israel slash Judah, the whole nation, and the judges was, um, was uh, Israel-wide. Mm -hmm. It was Israel-wide. There was no place that, well, they were you know less sinful. It just the whole thing started going downhill. The map up there, is that the size of like El Dorado County? From the top to the bottom? Uh, so so the only reason I know this is because of the nativity story. But uh, Nazareth is kind of up in this area. And to go to Jerusalem, which is down, here's Bethlehem. Jabos is where Jerusalem would be. That was like 70 miles. Um, as the crow flies, I, I'm, I might be getting this wrong. But about 70 mile journey. So it, the Holy Land is small. It's, it's very small. You could probably put 20 of these in California, you know, and, and have plenty of room. So it's a small area. Big stories, and that's why we often think the Holy Land is this vast territory, but it's actually rather small. But learning geography really helps. When I was looking, and there's, I got one or two more, but I got a bunch of maps for you tonight. No extra charge, don't worry. <laughs> um, but it's really interesting when you start studying geography and things start to come to mind. And I'll show you one later on, on a different map. Okay, so again, it, we're in verses 1 to 3. Now, King Jabin, he's called, this might be a title like the title Pharaoh. Why is that? Well, let's take a look at Joshua 11, 1 to 11. Okay, somebody on this side of the room to read. All right, Tim. <clears throat> What's that? <laughs> when, when you get there? When I get there. Oh, okay. Just, uh, 11. 1 to 11. Oh, wow. <laughs> when Jabin, king of Hazor, heard of this, he sent word to Jovah, king of Maiden, the kings of Shem. Well, I found a known then. Yeah. <laughs> but you didn't. Yeah. <laughs> Just mash them up. It doesn't matter. Kings of Shimron and, and Ashap. And to the northern kings who were in the mountains, in the Arabah, south of Kin Kinnereth, in the foot, western foothills, in Napath Dor on the west, to the Canaanites in the east and west, to the Amorites, the Hittites, Perizzites, the Jebusites in the hill country, and to the Hivites, the Oberman, in the region of Mizpah, they came out with all of their troops, a large number of horses and chariots, a huge army, as numerous as the sand on the seashore. All these kings joined forces and made camp together at the waters of Merim to fight against Israel. The Lord said to Joshua, Do not be afraid of them, because by this time tomorrow I will hand them all over to Israel, slain. You are, you are to hamstring their horses and burn their chariots. So Joshua and his whole army came against them suddenly at the waters of Merim and attacked them. And the Lord gave them into the hand of Israel. They defeated them and pursued them all, all the way to the greater Sidon, to Misrah, Maine, and the valley of Mizpah on the east, until no survivors were left. Joshua did to them as the Lord had directed. He hamstrung their horses and burned their chariots. At the time, Joshua turned back and captured Azor 
and put its king to the sword. Hazor had been the head of all these kingdoms. Everyone in it, they put to the sword. They totally destroyed them, not sparing anything to breathe, and burned up Hazor itself. So when you look at verse 1 of that text, it says, When Jabin, king of Hazor, heard of this. So it's probably a title, and there's a clue in the Hebrew language. I was looking at the last verse of chapter 4 today as I was wrapping up my prep for this study. And the article is put in, it, it, it says uh, uh, something about the Jabin. It doesn't just say Jabin, it says the Jabin. So, uh, you know, when you're young growing up and you read a more, more well-known story about Israel and they're enslaved in Egypt, you often think of, oh, it's Pharaoh. And, and when you're a kid, you think that's his name. And then you grow up a little bit, you realize it's the Pharaoh because he would die and then the next Pharaoh would show up. So that probably makes sense because this is almost 100 years earlier in Joshua chapter 11. And so by the time of the judges, Hazor has been built back up and they got a new Jabin on the throne. Well, the name Sisera is non-Semitic. So that, in other words, it's, it's a non-Semite name. Um, commentators think this guy is probably part of the... Uh, it's, well, I'll, I'll tell you this because it's really fascinating. Uh, most archaeologists and ancient historians, uh, well, they, we know that there was a group of people kind of called the Sea Peoples. They came across the Mediterranean and settled on the coast. The Philistines are part of this. We don't really know for sure where they came from. My personal theory is that maybe they were Greek colonists because the Greeks, of course, their, their society was flourishing. Uh, and they were starting to send colonists out. We don't really know. But this guy, in other words, he's not a Canaanite. He's a mercenary. And uh, he's hired probably by Jabin. Now, here's the point of this. We talked about this already. The pain of the Israelites caused them to cry out to Yahweh. Uh, and so we never thank God for the suffering that comes upon us. It's, it's a result of sin. But we sure thank God for what he does through the suffering. Uh, and so, uh, like Lori said earlier, what do, you, what do you do when something bad happens when you're hurting? You pray. That's a good thing. All right, let's uh, get to verses 4 and 5 of Judges chapter 4. <clears throat> Somebody read those verses, please. Allison, thank you. Now, Deborah, the prophetess, the wife of Lapidoth, was judging at Israel at that time. She used to sit under the palm of Deborah between Ramah and Bethel in the hill country of Ephraim. And the people of Israel came up to her for judgment. Okay, so here we have Deborah. Deborah is one of five women in the Old Testament who's described as a prophetess. And there are the references there. Uh, let's take a look at those. So I need one, two, three, four more readers. Who will do Exodus 15:20? Sue's got that in the back. Who will do 2 Kings 22, 14? Barbara Prato's got that. Who will do Isaiah 8, verse 3? Ron Chan's got that. And who will do Nehemiah 6, 14? Lori's got that. Okay? So we're going to hear about the, the other four women in the Old Testament who are called a prophetess. So Exodus 15, verse 20. Then Miriam the prophet, Aaron's sister, took a timbrel in her hand, and all the women followed her with timbrels and dancing. Yep, so there, that's after the great victory at the Red Sea. God drowns the entire Egyptian army. And Miriam then is called a prophetess. There's a number of ways this word, both in the New Testament language and the Hebrew language, is used. But, but at its very base level, it means to speak the words of God. And Miriam there certainly does that, right? She leads them in a song. Um, and we don't know if she sat down and composed it or if the words came to her from the Holy Spirit as she spoke. But here's this great song of victory. And if you went to Sunday school and you learned this song, uh, I will sing unto the Lord for he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and rider fell into the sea. You obviously didn't go to the same BBS I did. That's out of Exodus 15. All right, 2 Kings 22:14. So Hilkiah the priest, and Ahikam, and Aphor, and Shaphan, and Isaiah went to Hodah the prophetess, the wife of Shalom, the son of Tutva, son of Parhas, keeper of the wardrobe. Now she lived in Jerusalem in the second quarter, and they talked with her. I love that, keeper of the wardrobe. Yes. <laughs> and don't mess with me. Um, yeah, so she's called a, a, a prophetess, someone who will proclaim the words of God. And then Isaiah 8, verse 3. Then I made love to the prophetess, and she conceived and gave birth to a son. The Lord said to him, the Lord said to me, name him Maher Shalom. 
<laughs> Maher Shalal Hashbaz. Can you imagine calling him for dinner? <laughs> it would take longer to say his name than to call him for dinner. Yeah. So now the, that there, uh, that there instance, that instance in uh, in uh, Isaiah eight, we're not sure if it means that she actually was a prophet or if they're using just kind of a, a word to say she's the wife of the prophet. So they're using the the feminine uh, form of the word for prophet, because nowhere else does she say anything that I'm aware of uh, in Isaiah, and somebody else might be. Okay. And then Nehemiah 6.14. Remember Tobiah and Sanballat, oh my God, according to these things that they did, and also the prophetess Noadiah and the rest of the prophets who wanted to make me afraid. Okay, so Nehemiah is praying and he says, I got these, these uh, Sanballat and Tobiah, these guys have opposed every, bit, every work I've tried to do to repair the walls of Jerusalem. So remember them, God. Don't let them get away with what they've done. And then he mentions Noadiah the prophetess and others. And what were they trying to do again? The others who wanted to make me afraid. Who wanted to make me afraid. So she's a false prophet. Okay. So those are the instances we have in the Old Testament. Um, and so here's Deborah. She's the, the, the one we're talking about tonight, of course. And she's described as the, someone who's going to speak the words of God. That's, that's the base meaning of that word. Now, we're called, told that Deborah is judging. But what's interesting about this, when you look carefully at the grammar, it appears that this is referencing this particular case. Why is that? Because verse 5 literally says the children of Israel went to her for the judgment. It's not an abstract. They didn't go to her to be judged all the time. I'm not saying that that didn't happen, but it would be very unusual. But what it does literally say is they went to her for the judgment. So one commentary I was reading today said this. Here's what happens. The Israelites are crying out. They're, they're suffering terribly. Um, Sisera has the latest tank technology. Chariots were the tanks of the ancient world. Uh, in our family, we watched uh, a documentary on the Egyptian chariot. Now, that was a very different uh, climate, right? Very sandy, very dry. They had a lightweight chariot that was light years ahead of the competition, and it made them masters of the southern Mediterranean for a long time because they literally could run circles around their enemies. And they had one guy driving and one guy shooting. That's how they used it, and it was extremely effective. Changed the balance of power. Well, here you have the same thing happening now in Canaan. Here's this guy, Cicero, one of the sea peoples. Who knows where he came from? But he has these iron chariots. Um, and so they're crying out, and they're in, in trouble for 20 years. And, and so something's got to be done. They go to Deborah, the prophetess, and say, tell us what to do. That's what the commentator said, and I, I think he's right about this one. Okay, so what? Well, this says they came to her to have her settle their disputes. I know. And that's, I mean, is that the same as coming for the judgment? Oh, no, it isn't at all. And that's what all the translations say. But, you know, it's a translation choice. Uh, I'm not going to say that's wrong, but I think it makes a lot of sense. Why? Because if you look at the context, and, and I'm getting ahead of myself a little bit, but they, they cry out to the Lord, they go to Deborah, and she says, or sends for Barak, you got to do this. It's boom, boom, boom. One, two, three. Problem, word of the Lord, Barak. It makes a lot of sense with the context as well. Simply the 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 uh, grammar that says they went to her for the judgment. They're asking her a question about what do we do? What do we do about Sisera? We're, we're dying here. So I think that makes the best sense. I won't say it's wrong to say that they went for her, to her for judgment, but to me it doesn't make sense with the context because she just says, oh, she starts talking about Barak. Now, this is a nice simple map. That's why I put this up. Um, I found this in one of the electronic resources that I have because it gets rid of all the other name places and rivers and everything. So Dead Sea, Sea of Galilee, you guys know this from the New Testament. Here is where uh, Deborah is. This is where she was doing her thing. Uh, up here we have Kadesh, Zanim, Megiddo, Harosheth, the Kishon River. This is where the battle stuff is gonna take place. And Mount Tabor is where she's going to mention first. So it's just good stuff to keep in mind. All right, let's read verses six and seven. So they talk to Deborah, give us the judgment, and now she speaks. And Yahweh speaks these words to her. So what, uh, would somebody read that? Tom, you got that? She's, 
starting with six. six. She sent for Barak, son of Abinon from Kadesh and Naphtali, and said to him, The Lord, the God of Israel, commands you, Go take with you 10,000 men of Naphtali and Zebulon, and lead the way to Mount Tabor. I will lure Sisera, the commander of Jabin's army, with his chariots and his troops to the river Kishon, and give unto him, give him into your hand. Okay, so here's Yahweh's message to Barak. Verse 6 reminds us of the localized nature of the work of the judges. Uh, just a reminder, that's, that's how you make the chronology work. Because there were local wars, if you will, concerning one or two or three tribes. But there might be another judge who's working you know, a long ways away, by foot, of course. And God is working also through that judge at the same time. But here we clearly see words that point it to the north. Remember the, the map, Naphtali up there. Remember the one I just showed you towards the Sea of Galilee. So she is giving him into the hands of... No, Yahweh is. Yahweh speaks to him. Yep. What, is it, what does it say there in verse 6? She said, here's what the Lord says, right? Mm -hmm. The God of Israel. Here's what you should do. This is Yahweh speaking. So his, 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 uh, Yahweh's message to Barak is to get to Mount Tabor. Uh, and one of the commentaries I was reading said, you know, that, that sounds like unsound military advice. Because if you go up on a mountain and these chariots surround you, how are you going to get away? Answer, you're not. They can outrun you at every turn. You try to get off that mountain, you're going to get slaughtered. And they can just wait you out. And, and again, we think of mountains like, you know, uh, Mount Everest. Mount, it's not, they're not that big in Israel. Yahweh is clearly the one who is in charge of this battle, right? He says, here's what you should do, and here's what I'm going to do with Sisera. I'm going to lure him. And in fact, what happens is... Uh, in all likelihood, he, he hears Barak is taking his troops to Mount Tabor. And he goes, I got him. I'll surround him. I got him. They'll be pinned on the mountain. And then we'll pick them off. We'll wait for them to come down. They got to come down at some point, And we'll kill them all. Yahweh is the one who's in charge. He says, you should do this. I'm going to do this. It's all right. Verses 8 to 10. John. Barak said to her, if you go with me, I will go. But if you don't go with me, I won't go. Certainly I will go with you, said Deborah. But because of the course you are taking, the honor will not be yours. For the Lord will deliver Sisera into the hands of a woman. So Deborah went with Barak to Kadesh. There, Barak summoned Zebulon and Naphtali, And 10,000 men went up under his command. Deborah also went up with him. Okay. So Barak's got some apprehension about this, doesn't he? He only has to follow Yahweh's word. It's been given to him. I mean, uh, she's told them it's in the bag. Yahweh's got it. But he will not. And, and so this is a good illustration of the downward spiral of Israel's judges. Remember in the introduction, we talked about how not only do, do the people of Israel fail, but the judges throughout the book gradually get worse and worse. I mean, by the time you get to Samson, he's the last one. It's like, is, is the guy a believer even? I mean, I, I, I hope and think that he is, but you can, you can make a good case. It's like, what, what is he doing? He's a complete idiot, spiritually. Uh, and so we're starting to see that, right? Othniel did everything right. He, had a, he was married to a believing wife. He did what the Lord said. Everything went as it should. And, and in each time, it's getting a little bit worse. At this point, the hearer or reader, and if you haven't read this story, unfamiliar with this story, you're probably thinking, the glory's got to go to woman. Well, who would that be? Yeah, yeah it's got to be Deborah. And you'd be wrong. <laughs> but that's, you know, that's what we all assume at this point in the story. All right, let's take a look at verse 11. Someone to read that, way. Now, Heber and Kenite had separated from the other Kenites, that is, the descendants of Hobab, the father-in-law of Moses, and had, encamp had encamped as far away 
as Elon Bezdin or whatever, which is near Kadesh. Yep. And by the way, Elon also can mean a very large tree, and that's probably what it means here. Does anybody's Bible have that translation? By the great tree, yeah. So that's probably what it means here, because it's mentioned elsewhere in the Bible. Okay. Um, so you read this verse, and and this is one of the times you read in the Bible, and you go, why is this verse here? You know, uh, they're they're crying out to the Lord, and you got this interesting interchange between Deborah and Barak, and he kind of wusses out, and she says, okay, I'll go with you, but the glory's going to go to a woman. And then you get this verse that seems to make no sense at all, but it does. It absolutely does, um, because it is making a, a place for what's going to happen later. Okay, so it looks like I got yeah, I got my out of order here. So this seems to be a random verse, but it sets up an important character to come later. Now this Kadesh is different from Kadesh Naphtali, and that shouldn't surprise us. Um, well, I'll tell you what, when I grew up in Seattle, um, there's a town south of Seattle, and it's called Auburn. Yeah. And there's an Auburn north of Sacramento. You know there's an Auburn in like 10 times in every state. You travel, oh, it's another Auburn. Everybody has an Auburn. I don't know why it's popular, it just is. Um, and so Kadesh, the word means holy. And, and so uh, maybe people like calling it, hey, it's holy town or which can mean set apart, you know, whatever. So um, we, we talked earlier about how Baal, uh, there's like a, lots of local Baals. And so a, a, a name, a place would get its name and be called Baal of this or Baal of that. And, and so the Kadesh that we're talking about here is different enough from the Kadesh in Naphtali, which is way up north. Let's take a look at Joshua 19, 32 and 33. This is how we know that it is different. Who will read that? And yes, there's lots of place names tonight. I don't apologize for that. It's in the Bible. <clears throat> Who wants to read this? I'll read it. Okay. The sixth lot came out for the people of Naphtali, for the people of Naphtali, according to their <coughs> plans. And their boundary ran from Hela, from the Oak and Za'an al There's that Oak again. Mm -hmm. And you don't need to really uh, read the rest of it. But if you look at Naphtali, notice where, where does it end in, in verse uh, 33? Sure. Where does it end up, Barbara? Uh, at the Jordan. At the Jordan, right. And so, oh, so, so we're not talking about the, the Kadesh that's way up north where <laughs> Barak was. We're talking about the Kadesh that's down here by the great tree. Same tree Wayne uh, read. read. Okay, so verses 12 and 13, let's read that. Sue, thank you. When they told Sisera that Barak, son of Abinoam, had gone up to Mount Tamor, Sisera summoned from Haroseth Hagagoyim to the Kishon River, all his men and his 900 chariots fitted with iron. Then Deborah said to Barak, Go, this is the day of the Lord. This is the day the Lord has given Sisera into your hand. Okay, let's stop that. We're just 12 and 13, right? Oh, sorry. Yep. So, um, again, notice what happens. Sisera goes, he's going to Mount Tabor. I got him. And so he gets all his 900 chariots together. And we're we're going to massacre him. So here's a map of the battles. Yeah, it's pretty exciting. Isn't it? Yeah. 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 So here's a map of the battles. Yeah. 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 Um, and then you've got, um, here's the Kishon, goes out to the coast, this is the Mediterranean out here on the left, and the Kishon River runs all the way into here, and you've got where you see the red is the Israelite force, and the, the dot of red is Israelite volunteers, the green are the Canaanite forces, and so they're coming to Mount Tabor thinking they got him there, but the battle ends up taking place uh, somewhere else. Yeah. Okay, so now we can go on to verses 14 through 17 and hear what happens. John. Then Deborah said to Barak, Go, this is the day the Lord has given Sisera into your hands. Has not the Lord gone ahead of you? So Barak went down Mount Tabor with 10,000 men following him. At Barak's advance, 
the Lord routed Sisera and all his chariots and army by the sword. And Sisera got down from his chariot and fled on foot. Uh, Barak pursued the char chariots and army as far as Harasheth Agoyim, and all Sisera's troops fell by the sword. Not a man was left. Sisera, meanwhile, fled on foot to the tent of Jael, the wife of Heber the Kenite, because there was an alliance between Jabin, king of Hazor, and the family of Heber the Kenite. So now we know why Heber the Kenite was mentioned earlier. So you had to set that up. So that verse is supposed to be in the Bible. Isn't that weird? <laughs> <laughs> All right. So in, uh, as Deborah sp speaks to Barak, she uses the perfect tense in Hebrew. Typically, that's translated in, in, with the past. And so the, the past perfect here, has given, is a good way to translate that. It says, the victory is so sure, she speaks of it as if it has already happened. And you see that a lot in the prophets, uh, Isaiah, uh, some of the minor prophets as well. They talk about what God will do, and we translate it with the future in English, as we should. But it's called the prophetic perfect. It, it talks about as if it's already happened. And so this is, this is the power of the word of, of Yahweh. The victory is already won. And notice how Yahweh is the one who routes Sisera. Uh, let's see, what verse is that? Yeah, verse 15. So Yahweh is the one who does the work here. And what does that mean? Well, we'll look at this in more detail next week. But um, let's give us, let's take a little sneak peek. Chapter 15 give us the, gives us the details of how Yahweh won the victory. Uh, so someone to read chapter 15, verse 4, and verses 20 and 21. Chapter 15, verse 4, and verses 20 and 21. Wait. So Samson went and caught 300. Samson? Mm -hmm. oh, I'm sorry, it's a typo. It should say chapter 5. Oh. Stupid me. <laughs> Stupid me. Chapter 5. Why does it say 15? Who wrote that? <laughs> I did. Yeah. I did. Five. My dog would probably get it right. <laughs> Lord, when you went out from Sire, when you marched from the region of Edom, and the earth trembled, and the heavens poured, and the clouds indeed poured water. And, and then verses 20 and 21. Yeah. The stars fought from heaven. From their courses they fought against Assyria, and torrent Kishon swept them away. And the onrushing torrent and the torrent of Kishon marched on my soul with might. Okay, so Kishon again. Remember that's a river. Um, a lot of those rivers over there are seasonal. They run in the in the wet season, the the rainy season. Uh, they can dry up in the. Uh, in the summertime, the climate there is pretty warm, kind of like Southern Cal, quite a bit like Northern Cal. You can imagine the crops they grow around the Mediterranean, olives, wine, things like that, just like we do here. Very similar climate. Is flash flooding an issue in California? You better believe it is, especially in the South. Uh, you, know, you can be in the desert even and people drown and it, it rains like eight inches the entire year. But that one day you get two inches of rain, the ground is waterproof. And it just comes rushing down and sweeps them away. And so chapter 15 tells us how God did it. Chapter 4, or chapter 5. Chapter 5 tells us how God did it. Chapter 4 does not. And so we just got a little sneak peek uh, at how Yahweh won the victory. So, yeah, I don't know how I got 15 there. Tired brain. Oh, well. Make that correction in your study guide. If you're watching this on YouTube, it's chapter 5, <laughs> not chapter 15. Okay, uh, now what's interesting is Sisera and Barak go in different directions at first. Uh, Barak is pursuing the, the army. Sisera is like, each man for himself, I'm out of here. Sisera probably thought he was safe in the tent of an ally. Heber the Kenite has a treaty with, uh, uh, with Jabin the king, or the Jabin. But what's interesting about that, uh, the, the, it literally says there that uh, because there was shalom between Jabin, uh, king of Hazor, and between 
the house of Heber the Kenite. There was Shalom. So th that word Shalom is just an incredibly broad word. Uh, it basically means wholeness. Um, it means peace. And so here it means specifically some kind of peace treaty, probably. This says friendly relations. Friendly relations. Yeah. Well, and they got very friendly, I think, too. So. Okay, so here again, I, look at all these maps. Isn't this great? You have lots of maps today. Um, and, and so here's Mount Tabor, and then you've got the Kishon this way. And so the rain begins. And this map may not be super accurate, by the way. Obviously, we don't know exactly where the battle took place, but we know that the river Kishon had a big part to play, don't we? And we know that Mount Tabor was the initial place where Sisera was headed. And what probably happened is, uh, you remember that Deborah says to Barak, Yahweh says, I will draw him out. And so Sisera heads for Mount Tabor, and then probably Barak comes down and meets him down in here. It doesn't really matter. But what we have here then is the retreat. And so some of the forces go this way, uh, and some of them go that way. And so Barak first goes after uh, the retreating Canaanite force. I think many of them probably drowned. Uh, their chariots got stuck in the mud. They tried to get off. They were easy pickings for infantry. 10,000 men, 900 chariots, you know. Um, and, and so what looked like an advantage was a disadvantage. So if you're like me, and I, I love old World War II movies and things like that, right? Uh, in World War II, the Germans always had the better tanks. But what one way you could defeat a tank was if you could get the tank to drive in mud so thick that the tracks couldn't get any traction. And then they were sitting ducks. And you hear stories, some of them, you know, not movies, but actually true, where tanks would be lit on fire and the guys were inside and there was no escape. It's really, really nasty stuff. Similar thing probably happens here. They're in their, their high-tech iron chariots and they got stuck because iron's heavy. And the wheels sank in the mud and there was no way to escape the onslaught of the infantry. Uh, here we have Cicero now in his flight from the battlefield. There's that Oak of Zanim. Remember that? So Joshua, uh, we, heard, we heard about that one reading and then, and then Wayne uh, read it as well. That's where he goes. By the way, the Hill of Mora. I told you what's fun about these. You start to get the, the geography of the Holy Land in place. Uh, this is the hill where um, Elijah raises a boy from the dead. And on the other side of the Hill of Mora, Jesus raises the son of the widow of Nain. Oh. And what's fascinating about this, and I, and I did this when I preached on this, uh, and so I'm sure you all remember it. Um, but when Jesus raises the widow of Nain's son, what do the people say? Uh, surely a great what has arisen among us? A great prophet has risen among us because they knew the history. Elijah did it, now Jesus did it. Great prophet! Well, they kind of got it wrong, didn't they? Whereas Elijah prays for the miracle, Jesus just tells the young boy to get up. That's a whole other story. And then Endor. Anybody know what this is about? And I'm not talking Star Wars. <laughs> Where does Saul go when he's desperate before he's killed in battle with the Philistines? To a witch at Endor. Yeah. So as you become as you become familiar with the geography of the Holy Land, stuff really starts to come alive. I hated geography in school. I didn't like history either. Finally, when I got to the seminary, I guess I was finally mature enough to start actually listening a little bit. It really helps if you know geography. It really helps if you know the history because stuff really starts to come alive. Okay, so now we get to jail in Cicero. This is really interesting stuff. Beth, did you see my email today that I sent you? Yes. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Just kind of a wife and husband conversation. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I was laughing. Yeah. <laughs> Let's talk. Let's do some Bible study, honey. All right. So, now, there's no way I can summarize. I got about 10 minutes. There's no way I can, I can give you all the detail in 10 minutes. What's really fascinating about this text is that it may be that jail seduced Sisera to his death. Now, why do I say that? Let me, I don't want to get ahead of myself here. I need to look at my, my guide here. Don't be afraid. Well, I'm not afraid. It's in the Bible. Yeah, okay. So, so I'll give you the summary. So, when we get to this text, there are some Hebrew words used that are hardly used anywhere else in the Old Testament. Uh, and, and the one that's probably the easiest for me to explain, uh, where does, well, let's read the verses. I, I'm getting ahead of myself. So, let's read 18 to 22. Tom, you got that? 
<clears throat> Jael went out to meet Sisera and said to him, Come, my lord, come right in. Don't be afraid. So he entered her tent, and she put a covering over him. I'm thirsty. I'm thirsty, he said. Please give me some water. She opened a skin of milk, gave him a drink, and covered him up. Stand in the doorway of the tent, he told her. If someone comes by and asks you, is anyone here, say no. But Jael, Heber's wife, picked up a tent peg and a hammer. <laughs> <laughs> told you there was gore. And went quietly to him while he lay fast asleep, exhausted. She drove the peg through his temple into the ground, and he died. <laughs> Barak came by in pursuit of Sisera and Jael and went out to meet him. Come, she said, I will show you the man you are looking for. So he went in with her, and there lay Sisera with the peg through his temple, dead. Huh. On isn't, that day, you want to isn't that a pleasant story? Yeah. 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 No, we'll, we'll do the other verses next, right? Okay. Yeah. So quite quite the story, isn't it? Now remember Ehud? And he sticks the sword in, and the fat folds over it, and, and Eglon relieved himself in death. You know, I mean, it's just... And the same thing is in the story. There are parallels between the two stories. I don't think that's by accident. Eglon, uh, with the story of Ehud, he's kind of portrayed as a big fat sacrifice. Remember, we talked about how there's words in there that are normally used for uh, worship. And so um, Eglon is portrayed not as a powerful Moabite king, but as a stupid sacrifice. He even stands up so Eglon can, can run him through with the sword. And so we have some of the same stuff here, some of the same, not same language, but the same idea that's happening, that, that there are things being said in the text that we just aren't aware of. Um, and, and so one of them that's, that's pretty straightforward is the word for temple, right? Now, first of all, let me ask you this. How easy would it be to run a tent peg through someone's temple? You have to go all the way through the skull to the other side and then through the ground. That'd be exceedingly different, uh, difficult. Be exceedingly difficult. You have a big hammer, right? Yeah. When in doubt, get a bigger hammer, right? That's, that's an old, that's an ancient Hebrew saying, I think. Yeah. Home Depot just copied it. Yeah, it's probably snoring. Yeah. Well, and, and he may well have been. So, so this Hebrew word for temple is also used in in the book Song of Songs, and there it's translated as temple also, and there it doesn't make sense either. He he says. How lovely behind your veil are your, yeah, or is your temple? Really? Has any guy ever said that? <laughs> what we do say is, honey, when you're mad, I can see that vein right here, and it's going like this. <laughs> That's what we say, right? But th this word th is a noun, and the verb means to spit, and there's a noun of spittle. And so it's probably referring to the mouth. And that makes sense. How lovely behind your veil is your mouth. Now that I could see in, in the book of Song of Songs, right? And it also makes sense in this case with Sisera in the tent. If he's laying on his back and his mouth is open, you can go right through the soft tissue of the throat and into the ground. Right. So that's that's probably that's probably what happened here. Oh, it would it would kill you. you stick a spike through here, through the mouth. Yeah, through the mouth. The brain. Yeah, you'd go right through the brain stem. Yeah. You'd be you'd be dead. Yeah. Now, so that's that's not the racy stuff, but that's that. There's some hints there. Okay. So. What we have here in the text then, um, well, let me tell you another thing. So the, the Jewish rabbinic interpretation of this text is that Jael seduced Sisera and got him to fall asleep. And that's how she could, she could kill him easily because he was exhausted from making love to her. Um, the, the language of the Hebrew says, um, let's see, what... Uh, we're we'll starting verse 18 here. Oh, yeah. yeah, well, that too, right? Yeah. But, but Chuck, there, there's always a little left after the battle, isn't there? There's always a little left. And, and so there's this word for covering. It's only used once in the whole Old Testament. The whole Hebrew Old Testament is covering. And once it literally says, she covered him. 
It doesn't say with what. It just says she covered him. My, my version says rug. One time. Yes, it does. You have the PG-13 version, Ruth. <laughs> well, actually, that's what almost every version says. But but there's no linguistic evidence for that. We're just taking a guess, right? Uh, she covered him with herself. It's a very definite possibility. I'm not saying this is for sure what happened, but the way the language is, is written there, it's, it's very, very uh, likely. Uh, and again, the Jewish rabbis taught that's what happened. They said this is what happened. In fact, uh, let's see, there's a rabbi, Jonathan, in uh, some writings, one called the Nazir and the other called the Yebamoth. Uh, that rabbi claimed that Sisera and Jael had sex seven times. Well, well. That'll get you tired, right? That's a godly number. Seven <laughs> it's a very godly number. <laughs> Well, yeah. Seven for complete. Yes, that's right. Thank you, Wayne. Yeah. Thank you for bringing that keen exegetical insight into our conversation. Right? So where do they get seven? Is that just tradition? Yeah, it's just rabbinic tradition. Yep. Um, of course, there's something for sure. And and whether or not she did this, you know, the the important thing is, is that sister goes in, he trusts her enough to fall asleep. Now, one, another reason that they, they think this might be the case is that when, when Cicero, reading, uh, somebody reading English for me, uh, let's see, it's verse, verse 20. Somebody read verse 20 for me. Stand in the doorway of the tent. And he said to her, stand at the opening of the tent, and if any man comes and asks you, is anyone here, say no. Okay. So, you know what literally says in Hebrew? If anyone comes and asks you, is there a man here? Say, there is no man here. And so the text deliberately is saying, yeah, he, he ran away from the battle. He abandoned all his soldiers. He's not a man. Right? So that's kind of interesting as well. Now, here it said, he says, I'm thirsty. Give me some water. And she gave him, she gave him milk. milk. And that's another reason why they think, oh, I can give you something better than that. So that's why they think there might be some, she's trying to seduce him. She knows who he is. And uh, what's interesting is I'd really love to talk to Heber because he uh, apparently has made some kind of agreement with Jabin or the Jabin or whatever it is, doesn't matter. She is throwing her lot in with Israel. And I'm getting ahead of myself. But anyway, so th this text is very interesting. Uh, whether it's sex or whether it's just a blanket that she puts on him, um, you know, it's, it's at the end of the day, it probably doesn't matter that much, but I thought it was just fun to share with you guys. You could talk about it on the way home, make for a very interesting drive. <laughs> right? Now notice the force of the strike. The, the tent peg goes all the way into the ground. That would indicate pretty strong motive, right? Yes. And if your husband and your clan of Kenites has a has a treaty with Jabin, why would you do this? So, so we're, we're not told. Uh, by her actions, Jael is aligning herself with Israel as Rahab did before. Would someone please read Joshua 6, verse 25? Joshua 6, verse 25. <laughs> Joshua 6 uh, includes battle, Becky, uh, jo Joshua 6 is part of the account of the battle of Jericho. But Joshua spared Rahab the prostitute with her family and all who belonged to her because she hid the men. Joshua had sent his spies to Jericho and she lives among the Israelites to this day. To this day. Now, Pastor Seltz uh, on Sunday talked about genealogies, right? Mm -hmm. See, I'm not the only one. Huh? <laughs> so uh, he, he's absolutely right about that. We've looked at that genealogy before, haven't we? And we've seen the names there. Rahab is one of them. She's a prostitute and she's in the genealogy of Jesus. Mm -hmm. And that tells you that, that God takes people who are completely undeserving and, and brings them into his kingdom. And so you see Rahab doing that. And so the parallels between Rahab and Jael are, are pretty strong, aren't they? She does the same thing. Now, we don't know what Heber said when he came home. Or we don't know what happened to them or anything. But here we see Jael throwing in her lot, uh, just like Rahab did. Okay, verses 23 and 24. John. 
On that day, God subdued Jabin, king of Canaan, before the Israelites. And the hand of the Israelites pressed harder and harder against Jabin, king of Canaan, until they destroyed him. Okay. So in verse 23, that's where it says the Jabin. So that's why yeah, I think there's a linguistic clue too that this is probably a title. Uh, the word subdue was also used at Judges 3.30. And we're not going to look it up. You can do it on your own. And then verses 22 and 23, which John just read, along with the beginning of this account, chapter 4, verses 1 to 2, bring a symmetry to the account. In other words, the beginning and the end are sort of like bookends. And so at the beginning of the account, what happens? Israel, now the word subdue isn't used, but Israel is sold to Jabin, or the Jabin, and they're in a bad way. And at the end of the account, then we see Jabin now is subdued, and Israel gets stronger and stronger. So the positions are reversed. All right, summary. Women have a powerful effect in this account. And by the way, we talked about this in the introduction. Uh, women in this book uh, sometimes are treated brutally. And ladies, when we get to the end of it, it's appalling to see what happens uh, to a woman uh, toward, toward the end of the book. But the other interesting thing about judges is that there are also some places where you see some very strong women who do pretty amazing things. Uh, Aksa, remember, she was the wife of uh, Othniel and and at first, she's like a trophy. Whoever captures the city gets my daughter in marriage. But then she says, well, ask my dad for this, these springs. And she goes and does it herself. And here we see Deborah, who is a prophetess. And she says, here's the word of the Lord. Barak is kind of a wussy, and he, he, won't go, he won't go unless she goes with him. And Jael then, uh, she's the one who kills this terrible enemy of Israel. It's not even Barak the judge. It's this woman in a tent who's... Decided, I'm going to do this. You know, it's amazing, isn't it? And so uh, just keep your ears open as you read the book of Judges and see what happens to the women, but also watch what the women do. And then this often used phrase, King of Canaan, uh, and I thought the commentator who, who I was reading for this section had a really good point. He said, this brings a warning that was not heeded by Israel. Over and over and over again, you have the Jabin who is called King of Canaan, King of Canaan, King of Canaan, King of Canaan. King of Canaan. And, and when we saw uh, Ehud, it was king of Moab, king of Moab, king of Moab. And so the, this type of king, this type of Canaanite king is a bad deal. Don't do it. And we're going to find out that the Israelites didn't listen. They did it anyways. Because you think the first king of Israel is Saul, and you're right. But there's a guy who tries to become king. And it goes horribly wrong uh, for Israel. Questions, comments, thoughts, Wayne. You said something about starting here with Deborah, the, the women in there, is the decline of it? No, I mean, everybody declines in Israel. What, what I'm saying about the women is, uh, sometimes women are treated horribly. Uh, but you also see in the book of Judges, a lot of women who are, who are crafty, who are clever, who scheme, who are powerful. Uh, Deborah is, is a prophetess. Um, Jael kills this, I mean, this guy's a warrior. He's a commander of a force of 900 chariots, and she lulls him into sleep and kills him. Well, he ran into her death. Yeah, and he hid like a little kid <laughs> under something. We just don't know what it is. Right? Um, you'll see later, uh, who's another woman I'm thinking of? Uh, Delilah, right? Here's Samson, this mighty, powerful judge. Philistines can't take him down. Who takes him down? Delilah does. Right? So that's the interesting thing about women in the book of Judges. Uh, sometimes they're treated horribly like property or slaves, but you also see women who are very strong and, and very capable. So it's, it's very interesting. <coughs> Other comments or thoughts or questions? Okay, let's pray. Once again, Lord Jesus, we are reminded that you are the one who wins our victories for us. You rescue your people. Yes, you use hum human agency, people to do your will. But you are the one who defeats our enemies. And we thank you that you've defeated Satan, you've defeated sin, and you've defeated death on our behalf. A day is coming when your people will have rest on all sides from their enemies. We look forward to that. In the meantime, keep our ears and our eyes open to, to spread the gospel with the people we meet in the coming week. Amen. Amen.